back at the beginning of the summer entitled Wise Up, and we've got this Sunday and next Sunday, and we wrap it all up. But today I want to ask you a question. What do you think is the number one sin in God's eyes? If you had to write, if we had a list up here, and we said, okay, we're going to list all the sins, what do you think would be the number one sin on God's list? Any idea? I think if we were to list the sins, we could, we could list uh, murder and stealing and lying and cheating. I mean, we could make a pretty extensive list, but the thing that would top the list in God's eyes of the number one, uh, many of you, 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 uh, you probably watch late night uh, talk shows. David Letterman, he was real popular having the top ten things. You know, he'd always count off these top ten deals. Well, if we counted off God's top ten sins, what do you think would be at the top of the list? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. And it's found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, and verse 16 and 17. It says this, there's six things that the Lord hates. Indeed, seven are repulsive to him. So he's saying there's seven things that God just goes, that's all, I hate it, it's ugly, it's, it's despicable. What is the seven things God hates, and what is the number one thing? Well, let's read. Go on. He's in Proverbs 6, 16, he said, These six things the Lord hate. Indeed, there are seven things that are repulsive to him. Here's number one. A proud look. The attitude that makes everyone overestimate themselves and discount others. The number one sin in God's eyes is pride. Pride. I, I don't know uh, if you remember this or not, but I, I, back in the 80s, 70, 80s, there was a singer called Mac Davis, and uh, he used to do a song that went something like this. Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Can't stop looking at the mirror Cause I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a heck of a man. Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Remember that? Thank you, thank you. Pride, pride. You know, me and Pastor Phil, we were talking about this this past week, pride and all this stuff, and, and he said something profound. He said, you know, the problem with some people is they don't admit their mistakes. He said, if I had any, I'd admit mine. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's prime, just teasing. Pride. How does God feel toward pride? God doesn't just dislike pride, or he doesn't say, well, I just disapprove of pride, or I look unfavorably upon pride. God hates pride. In fact, a meal of maggots does for us what pride does to God's stomach when he sees pride displayed in our life. The scripture says in Proverbs 8, 13, he said, I hate pride and arrogance. In Proverbs 16, 5, he said, the Lord despises pride. In the same way that God gives grace to the humble, he said, I oppose the proud. Listen to some of the words mentioned in Proverbs. It's all throughout the book of Proverbs, but here's just some of them. In Proverbs 21, mockers are proud and haughty. They act with boundless arrogance. Haughtiness goes before destruction. Humility precedes honor. Pride ends in humiliation while humility brings honor. He goes on to talk about how God hates a proud look and he promises to destroy the house of the proud. And then we come up to Proverbs 16, 18, and 19 where he says, Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before fall. Better to live humbly with the poor than to share the plunder with the proud. You ever wonder why God would put such strong language to say that he actually hates something? Why would God say that he actually hates pride? I think one of the reasons is because uh, pride led to the fall of man. It was pride that caused man to sin and eventually become separated from God. 
It was pride that challenged an angel to, to lift himself up against the Most High God and be cast out of heaven, and an angel becomes the devil. It was Lucifer who went to the, the couple in the garden, and he told Eve, he said, if you'll eat of this fruit, you'll be like God. He was appealing to her pride that I can be somebody, I can be important. And because he appealed to her, pride came on the scene, and she gave in to, to temptation. And you know the rest of the story. William Barclay said this, he said, pride is the ground on which all other sins grow and the parent from which all other sins come. It all starts with pride. It was pride that started this whole downward spiral of mankind. That's one reason God hates pride. Another reason God hates pride is because we don't have anything to be proud about. We don't have anything to be proud and arrogant about. I mean, do critics give awards to the canvas? Or do they give a Pulitzer to the ink? Or do, does a scalpel get all this glowing admiration when there's a successful surgery? No. They're only tools. They get no credit for what's accomplished. We may be the canvas, we may be the paper or the ink, or we may be the scalpel, but we're not the one who deserves the credit. Nowhere is this made more abundantly clear than in the book of Psalms, chapter 23. He puts it all in perspective. Listen to the way this, this reads out. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I'll not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil. And just to make sure there's no misunderstanding in all this, right in the middle of that passage or that poem that, that the psalmist wrote, he says this, he makes it abundantly clear who gets the, the credit, who gets the praise and the glory for it. And he says this, that it is for his name's sake. In other words, there's no other name on the marquee, there's no other name up in lights, there's no other name on the front page. He said it's all for him, it's for his name's sake. His name's sake. It's all for His glory. You may say, well, well, why? What's the big deal? Does God have an ego problem that He doesn't want us to get any of the credit and the glory that He wants to get at all? No, God doesn't have an ego problem, but we do. We're about as responsible as a kid in Toys R Us or about as responsible as I am at Baskin Robbins. We just we can't be trusted. We can't be trusted. See, God takes all the credit because he knows we can't handle all the credit. He knows we can't handle all the pride. We're not content with just a bite of praise. We want to eat it all, don't we? We, want it, I just, we just gorge on it because we want the praise. We're not content with just a little bit. When we get too much praise, <clears throat> it messes with our systems. Our heads begin to swell, our hearts shrink, our brains shrink, and pretty soon we begin to think that we had something to do with our success. Pretty soon we forget that we're simply made out of dirt and rescued from sin. God hates pride. With the same intensity that God hates pride, he honors humility. God will honor humility. Reminded of a story, two men were waiting outside of the pearly gates to get admission into heaven and St. Peter came out and he said, hey, I only have room for one person. So, he said, which one of you is more humble? Who do you think would step up? You see, in fact, the humble, God says, if you're humble, I'll give you great treasure. Humility results in honor. So, Proverbs 15, 33, humility goes before honor. He promises wisdom with the humble. He promises direction to teach us the way uh, to the humble. He promises grace to the humble. So God says, rather than, than pride, you need to develop humility. You don't hear a lot about that. You haven't heard a lot about humility in the elections going on, in the campaigning, have you? You don't hear it a lot on the nightly news. You don't, you don't see it displayed a lot about humility. It's all about me, number one, what I can do, what, what we can do, and you don't hear a lot about humility. So what I want to do this morning is 
we know God hates pride, so let's talk just a minute about humility. How can we cultivate humility in our lives? I want to give you just a few things that could help us develop humility in our life. And the first one is this, to uh, assess yourself honestly. Assess yourself honestly. A pastor, he walked in, was walking through the church one day, and as he got close to the auditorium, he was overwhelmed with the presence of God and, and just God in general. And he went into the auditorium and went straight down to the front, knelt at the altar, and he began to beat his chest. And he said, I am nothing. I am nothing, O Lord. And as he was doing this, the worship pastor walked by, and he heard the pastor, and he stepped in the auditorium, and he was overcome with a sense of God's presence and power. And he went down to the altar beside the pastor, and he started beating his chest, saying, I am nothing, I am nothing. Well, as it happened, basically the whole staff came by, the minister of education, the student, they all came by, same thing, overwhelmed, and they all came down to the altar, they were beating their chest, going, I am nothing, Lord, I am nothing, Lord. The janitor came walking by, and he heard it, he stepped in, and he was overwhelmed too, and he went down to the altar as well and started beating his chest saying, I am nothing, O oh Lord, I am nothing. The pastor opened one of his eyes and looked over and saw him, and he nudged the worship pastor, and he said, Can you believe this? Look who thinks they're nothing. It's pride. Assessing ourselves honestly. Understand that humility is not the same as low self-esteem. There's people that confuse that. Well, the more awful I am and the lower I make myself, you know, I just, I'm no good, I'm worthless. It's not about that. That's not humility. Humility doesn't mean that you don't think you have anything to offer. Humility is knowing exactly what you have to offer and nothing more. Romans 12.3 said this, Don't think you're better than anyone else or don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. I love the way the Phillips translation states this. He said, don't cherish exaggerated ideas of yourself or of your importance, but try to have a sane estimate of your capabilities. Humility begins by accessing ourselves honestly. The next thing is don't take your successes too seriously. Don't take your successes too seriously. Seriously, Deuteronomy 80 said, When your silver and your gold increase, beware, because your heart may become proud. We counteract this pride with reminders of the brevity of life and the frailty of wealth. Ponder your success and count your money in a cemetery and remember that neither one of those that you can take with you when you leave this earth. In fact, Ecclesiastes 5.15, he said, We all come in... Uh, come in the end of our lives as naked and as empty-handed as the day that we were born. We can't take our riches with us. Don't take your success too seriously. Next thing is don't ce uh, or celebrate the significance of others. Celebrate the significance of others. Philippians 2.3 said, In humility, consider others better than yourself. It was said of Winston Churchill that he said every wedding he attended that he wanted to be the bride. And every funeral he attended, he wanted to be the deceased. Why? Because he wanted to be the center of attention. He wanted to be at the front uh, of all that was going on. Kind of like the little schoolboy who came home one day from elementary school and he came running in the front door and said, Mommy, 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 I got the part, the tryout for the school play. I got the part. And she's like, whoa, slow down, son, slow down. What part did you get? He said, I get to sit in the audience and clap and cheer. I read that and I thought, when we have the chance to sit in the audience and clap and cheer, do we do it? Or are we the ones sitting out there going, I should, that should be me, I should be up, that should be my part. Celebrate the significance of others. When we do that, our head will start fit, fitting our hat size when we celebrate the success of others. So we need to assess ourselves honestly. Don't take success so seriously. Celebrate the significance of others. And this third, fourth one is don't demand your own parking place. Don't demand your own parking place. The words of Jesus in Luke 14, he said, go and sit, uh, go sit in a seat that is not important. 
When the host comes to you, he may say, friend, move up here to a more important place. Then all the other guests will respect you. Read an interesting article back in 2006. A New York judge allowed Jose Luis Espanol to legally change his name to Jesus Christ. Following that decision, Espanol said he was happy and grateful that the judge approved the change, and he also said that he was moved to seek the name change about a year prior to that decision when he realized that I am the person that is that name. Demanding our parking place. We're all a little like Jose, except we're a little more subtle. We want to grab the title Lord every time that we can to claim management of our life. I was told one time in, in church years ago, I wouldn't wear uh, a tie on Sunday night or Wednesday nights when I would speak. And somebody came to see me one day, and they sat down and they said, you need to wear a coat and tie every time you step in public because that commands respect. And I thought, man, if that's true, I'm going to start wearing a coat and tie at home. <laughs> I'm going to wear it out on the golf course. I'm going to wear it in a Walmart. I'm going to wear a coat and tie everywhere because that demands respect. No, it doesn't demand respect. Demanding respect is like chasing a butterfly. You chase it, you'll never catch it. But if you sit still, it may possibly come and light on your shoulder. French philosopher said, do you wish people to speak well of you? Then never speak well of yourself. Maybe that's what the writer of Proverbs had in mind in Proverbs 27 when he said, don't praise yourself, let someone else do it. Assess yourself honestly, don't take success seriously, celebrate the successes and significance of others, and don't demand your own parking place. But this last one I want to give you, I think is the key to all of it. If we're to cultivate humility, in our life in a way that will honor God and that God can work in and through our lives, then this fifth thing is so critical. And that is if we want to develop humility in our life, we need to live at the foot of the cross. We need to live at the foot of the cross. Listen to Galatians, Paul's words in Galatians 6. He said, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need only to pause at the base of the cross to be reminded that the maker of the stars would rather die than to live without us. And that's a fact. So that, if you need to boast about anything, we need to boast about that. We need to boast about the cross, remembering that we all stand on level ground before the cross. The cross is a vivid reminder that we have Nothing, nothing to boast about. We're all lost. We're all sinful, hell-bound people who couldn't do anything about it. We couldn't do enough good. We couldn't be good enough. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't possibly impress God. In fact, we were wicked to the core. The Scripture said that all, that includes everyone in this room this morning, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The scripture also said there is none righteous, not even one, that we're all in the same boat. We had totally cut ourselves off from God because of our sinfulness, because of our pride and our arrogance. But the scripture also says that, by, that while we were still sinners, while we were still wicked, while we were still self-centered, while we were still proud and arrogant and boastful, that Christ died for us on the cross, that he took our shame, our guilt, our sin, and our disgrace. And now for those who will humbly bow at the foot of the cross and acknowledge our sinfulness and acknowledge what Christ did for us on the cross, he said, I offer forgiveness, I offer a fresh start, I offer eternal life. In fact, he said, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new person. The old is gone and the new has come. If we have anything to boast about, let us boast about the cross. Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah 9. He said, don't 
let the wise brag about their wisdom. Don't let heroes brag about their exploits. Don't let the rich brag about their riches. If you brag, brag about this and this only, that you understand and know me. Wow. I think other than the person of Jesus Christ, one other person in the Bible, I think, that vividly demonstrated humility and knew what it was about is found in the person by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was born to prepare the way for Jesus. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, John's sole job was to prepare the way for people to, to find the Messiah. And John had all these followers, and he was baptizing people, and everybody was, ooh, you know, John, John, he's the man, John the Baptist. And, and they were all, he had all these people following him and all these disciples that John the Baptist had. And we pick up his story in John 1 and said, this is John's testimony. When the Jewish leaders sent priests and uh, temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, they said, who are you? He came right out and he said, I am not the Messiah. I'm not the man. I'm not the one that's going to bring salvation. I'm not the one that's going to cure man's sin problem. I'm not the one that's going to do all these great miracles. I'm not the Messiah. I am not him. They said, well then, t who are you? They asked. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet that we were expecting, the, the Messiah that had been promised to come centuries before? Are you him? He said, no. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And this is very interesting. John replied, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, he said, I'm a voice. I'm just a voice. You came out here expecting, you know, a dog and pony show and miracles and big hoopla. You came out expecting all this stuff of a great Messiah. And he said, you want me to tell you who I am? Here's who I am. I'm just a voice. Just a, a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. He goes on to describe who he is. He said, I'm not even worthy to be the Messiah's slave or to even untie the straps on his sandals. I read this and I think how easy it would have been for John, to, they say, who are you? And he could have said, hey, me and the Messiah, we're tight. We're close. We're related, actually. And, and, and we're, we're good friends. And I'm doing here, you know, and everybody come here and come see me and come, come see what I'm doing and come hear my words. It had been very easy for him to step up into the center stage in the spotlight because I'm the man <laughs> preparing the way for the Messiah. But when he had his opportunity and they said, who are you? Tell us who you are. And he said, I'm just a voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the Messiah. It goes on to read, he said, the next day John saw Jesus coming and he said to all his followers that were with John, they saw Jesus coming down the road and he said to his followers, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he is the one I'm talking about when I say a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. We read on, and it says the following day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there's the Lamb of God. He's the one I've been telling you guys about. He's the one that I'm all about. It's all about him. And he starts pointing to him, and it said when he did, Two of John's disciples, when they heard this, they left John and they followed Jesus. Well, I can't believe they're following him. I mean, I've been with them for all this time, and I've invested all this in these guys, and here comes the Messiah just waltzing along, and, and they see him, and now they're going to follow him, and they're not going to follow me anymore. Huh. I'll post that on Facebook. No, when they saw him, John said, hey... Stop following me. Follow him. He's the one. I'm just the voice. He's, he's the man. He's the Messiah. 
We read later on, just a couple of chapters later in John, John's in prison. And he sends his disciples to find Jesus. They find him. It says, so John's disciples came to Jesus and they said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the river, the one you identified as the Messiah, he's all, they come back to John telling him the story. They said, we, we've seen Jesus and he's baptizing all these people in the Jordan River and identifying himself as the Messiah and everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. John says, you know yourselves how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. And then he makes an astounding statement. He said, I'm filled with joy at his success. And he must become greater. I must become less. Here was a man who assessed himself honestly, who didn't take his successes too seriously, who celebrated the significance of others, who didn't demand his own parking place, and who lived at the foot of the cross. In fact, Jesus, when he was talking about John on one occasion in Matthew 11, he said this, I tell you the truth, of all who ever lived, now think about this for a moment, of all who ever lived, Adam, Eve, Noah, Moses, Abraham, Elijah, Daniel, Esther, all of these people, he said, of all Whoever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. A lesson in humility. So how do we overcome pride and humility in our life? We need to assess ourselves humbly. Don't take our successes too seriously. Let's celebrate the significance of others and don't demand our own parking place and live at the foot of the cross. We're going to brag. Let's brag about what God has done for us. We're going to pray in just a moment, and then the band's going to lead us in a song I think is so powerful and brings out this point of living at the foot of the cross. But before we sing, I'm going to pray. And I just want to ask you this morning, we said at the very beginning, pride is the number one sin. If you trace every sin back to its origin, it will all come back to pride. Because pride keeps us from admitting we need help. Pride keeps us from admitting that we're sinful people. That's why God hates it so much. And maybe you're here this morning and pride is keeping you from God. Pride is keeping you from either surrendering your life to God. Pride is keeping you from surrendering a particular area of your life to God. Pride is keeping you from just from opening up and embracing Him in your life. It's pride that's keeping you there. And he said pride leads to destruction, but humility leads to honor. Now I'm going to ask you as we all pray in just a moment that whatever it is in your life, maybe you've never fully surrendered your life to Christ, pride has held you back. Maybe you're hurting today and, and we asked every week for the prayer team to come and get into place and if you'd like someone to pray with you concerning your needs, to come and so often we sit still in our pride because what would people think if they knew I had a problem? What would people think if, if I was hurting? They would think less of me. Pride. Pride will paralyze us. So as we pray, I want to challenge you this morning that whatever that area is in your life, that you would surrender it to God and say, God, I humbly bow this morning at the foot of your cross and declare that the only thing I have to brag about today is your grace, your mercy, 
and what you've done for me. Let's pray together. Father, we humbly come before you this morning. Stripped of all the props. And God, we come and kneel at the foot of the cross. Declaring if we have anything today to brag about. It's to brag on you. And your amazing love and grace and mercy you've shown us. I pray this morning, Father, that you would help us all. I, I struggle with this monster in my life on a daily basis, God. So many times I'm tempted to think myself more important than others. God, help me to be conscious of the fact that it's all because of you. And that we would walk humbly before you and humbly before each other. And God, you said as we as a people humble ourselves before you that you'll lift us up we'll receive honor from you and that's our desire our prayer this morning God thank you for this in Christ's name